everyone for being here with us tonight. Um, before we present and tell you more about us, can I ask you to give me a show of hands of how many of you are actually developers working in the field of IT and development, and how many of you are developers? Good. Um, how many of you are actually developing something related to or connected to the blockchain world? Okay, thank you. Um, so we're here tonight to tell you more about our latest project, um, Process of Things. We believe that um, we're onto something very special. Uh, we all obviously believe being, you being here obviously means that you're interested in the field and we all believe that the blockchain has the potential as technology to transform the world and to change how we function as society, as people, how we deal with processes, with assets and in between ourselves. Um, and to us, it's, um, it's a really special technology that once utilized correctly can really uh, have a transformational effect on society. We, we do believe that. Um, there are a number of things about it and I don't think we'll have enough time tonight to speak about all of them, but I'll just touch on some, we'll just touch on some of the topics that we believe are important and are important to us. Uh, how hashing works, how we believe that process things can help and change how processes are managed. Um, one of the main things about process things that you'll find out along the way is that it's fully based off trust and we treat trust as the most important aspect um, in what we're creating. We're, how we are using blockchain and what's different with the process of things. How we believe that the process of things will become a tool for <coughs> transforming our world in many, many ways. Um, identity and digital footprint and transactional cryptocurrencies. And yeah, you will find about those things along the way. The team that you see here, most of them we have been working together um, with Craig. We have been working together for more than 10 years on different, different projects. Um, mainly focused on automation. All of them were technological, so we are hardcore geeks. Um, the rest, yeah, you'll, you'll be able to find out more on the website and soon from the videos to come. The current state in the world is really demanding change. This is what we believe in. And um, technology has the potential, the blockchain technology has the potential to, to transform and change that and give us the tool to actually fix a lot of the problems one of the things, that, though, is that if technology is misused or misunderstood, then we can see it as a problem instead of a solution. There are many problems in the current state of the world. Um, exponential te techno technology growth is followed by a lot of a, lot of a big gap in the knowledge difference between people knowing how to work with that and people that have no idea what this is. We have lack of adoption of, of um, the emerging technologies and innovation, and like blockchain is the same. In blockchain, for example, people see mainly um, when they when you speak about blockchain, if they don't know what this is, they, they think about Bitcoin. They think about how can we make money fast, and that's the that's where it ends. And the technology has a lot deeper implications than that. Yeah, lack of adoption, false scarcity. The world is an abundant place. We actually have enough. We believe we have enough to 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 sort that the planet has enough enough resources. But it's just the world is not being treated as a resource-based economy. It's treated in a completely different way. And with the, right, with the right tool and the right approach, we believe we can fix that. Distribution ownership, shared economy. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the term shared economy uh, and shared ownership. But do you believe that if each one of you um, has a, a drilling machine, you think, and if we live together, you think that that's needed? Don't you think that we need a set number of things that each one of us can use? Because right now the commercial driven world is basically stimulating each one of you to have every item possible and own it. But ownership doesn't have to be like this. But managing shared ownership is a different, poses different challenges and different questions and different problems. Um, yeah, and closed source. Because to, put, to, to make this clear, everything that we do we, we're firm believers in open source as a principle of managing and principle of bringing evolution to the world. So you can, everything that we are going to say, make sure that you look at it from the open source perspective, because that's, that's how we, we see it. Um, so yeah, so the way forward, the way we see moving forward in, in the, current, um, the current world and also um, the way that 
the why we're building the process of things is that it will help focus on the right on the solutions. We see it as being part of a, a meta process because process of things is always going to help us manage processes between assets, between devices, between te technology communication like machine to machine, people between people, processes and assets. They all require different uh, types of communication, but process of things can manage all of that. And and to us, the process of things is um, a way to unite technology and people and, and basically gather us towards a, a common goal. It's just a tool. So decentralized governance, um, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, artificial intelligence, smart contracts, it's all a part of a new paradigm that uh, we're seeing now emerging in the world. And it poses, like I said, it poses new questions, it creates new opportunities, and at the same time, uh, right now, we, we're, I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the focus is on cryptocurrencies, the focus is on get-rich-quick schemes, ICOs, how can we make money, but the technology that's behind it is kind of left misunderstood, misinterpreted, and there is not enough information about it. One of the, one of the main things about decentralized governance is how do we do it without having a central authority? Speaking with the cloud. Um, so this is one of the things that we're going to tackle with the technology is that everybody takes control of their own self. Okay, we don't have a third party that says, yes, you are a human. You are welcome to this planet and what's your name going to be, sir? Um, you know, we don't have that. So, <coughs> next slide. Yeah, about, about how the world <coughs> works right now, everything is centralized. If you think about it, the way that governments work, the way that companies work, <coughs> the way that communities are managed, nations, everything is centralized. And so far it looked like this is the only solution. But we now know it's not the only solution and that there are other ways that we can manage processes on a lower level and manage them even more effectively, manage them without trust, uh, trusting third parties or without needing third parties, which is really going to change a lot of industries on a deep level. One of the things about uh, processes, everything in the world can feel so complicated, okay? Um, but if we, if we break that complication down into simple little steps, these are processes. Processes are linear. You know, you may think that you have many different directions you can travel in life, but everything is linear up to a point. Then you make a decision which way to go, left or right, okay? So we found that by breaking everything down into a step-by-step -step process, we can make incredibly complicated systems very, very simple. Yeah, one of the main differences is that the way we treat objects is that we attribute the information that belongs to the object. It belongs to the object. I'm, I, I may be the object. And all information about me, I would like to own that information. I don't want to give it out freely in exchange for... Because everyone keeps saying, if you want to use technology, you have to give up privacy. Forget about privacy if you want to use technology. And we say, why should we do this? Why don't we take a different approach where I can steal all my data and it can travel with me? Because one of the most important things and one of the biggest things that we changed in the way processes are handled is that we say that the most important thing is the local environment. You know, I may speak to him when he's in New York and I'm in London or something else, somewhere else, but when we are together, this is what really matters to us. And right now, if I had a way to know your interests, I wouldn't be that much interested in your names. Because, yeah, they are a label. You carry it with you. means something to you. means something to who you are, probably. But at the same time, I'm more interested about what, what are your aspirations? What do you want to achieve in life? What are your interests? And this kind of information you can share with the world because if it's true, it's not going to change. You know, it's, it's who you are. And why not being able to find people around you based on such, um, such layer of information. And this can travel with you. The way we're building it in POTS, information pertains to the object, which means that it's attached to the object, it travels with the object, <coughs> and it's not, and it, the, main, the, the, main, the main principle is the locality, the local yeah. environment. We, we broke the whole system down to three main points. One, a location. A location is a place where things happen. Um, a coffee shop, you have coffee. In the kitchen, you cook your food. Love. Every location has a process. 
<coughs> okay. Um, so we, we took a location, and then we said, okay, let's have an object, something that we can interact with. So that object could be a, a bottle of milk, it could be a car, it could be any, any object. And then there's you. You are the center of the universe. Everything that you do revolves around you. Your interactions with people around you, with, with um, places around you, with, with objects. objects around you. The relationship is about you. It's not a centralized database somewhere in the server running algorithms on your decisions and what you probably are going to do next. It's about what you're doing now, in the moment, how you're interacting with that world around you. Yeah, and this is the thing that most of our, most of the things in our life seem to be events, like something happens, but an event is a series, I mean, an event, event actually, that what leads to an event is usually a process. One of my favorite quotes is, it took me 10 years to become an overnight success. And that illustrates it perfectly. Um, but you cannot improve something you don't have data for. So this is a thin, this is a thin line balance between how do, we, uh, how, do we, uh, how do we measure and how do we manage things without risking the privacy and without giving away information. Because without, without measuring things, you cannot, we cannot manage them. And this is where we are really challenging, th ch challenging the current status quo, challenging how everything is being built and how things are being managed with the way we handle processes. Um, there are multiple, multiple applications, and actually more applications of the technology that we currently can manage on our own. And, and one of the, the, best, uh, the best things is that being open source means that anyone can join us and build stuff with us, um, which we believe should happen and it's actually happening already because there are so many, so many uses and so many applications that even before launching the, the technology in, in a better phase where we could actually test it, we had already more requests than we, we knew what to do with. People were asking us about managing, uh, managing um, 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 cattle in, 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 uh, in Mongolia, um, what was the, the Kashmir Golds. Uh, people were wanting to use this as, as in, in restaurants for managing the menu and handling orders, managing assets in that data in data and asset management companies. And it was we, we didn't you know it, it, we knew on, we were on the right track because it was growing faster than we could develop it, which was a good thing. Um, so about we set up that uh, one of the main things is trust, and, and you'll find out more about this. And I, I think it will take more of a uh, it will take. A, it will be a process for you to really understand what we uh, mean when we say trust. Because trusting someone is not something you can explain. Like just you know, I can tell you how to trust me. You know, it doesn't happen. Doesn't happen this way. And it doesn't happen the same way in our system, uh, in our platform. Um, and um, yeah, Craig can tell you more about the technical aspects. And if you're interested in more, uh, well, learning more of how it works from the technical side, you can speak to him later. One of the interesting points on this slide is we, we <coughs> in a, from the app point of view from the mobile phone, we're, we're basically saying your, the POT application is the interface between, it's basically your digital shadow. It's, a self, it's yourself, okay, but it, of a digital world. It trans, it's, um, transcends the gap between digital reality and physical reality, okay? So what we wanted to do is make sure that you had control of your own identity. So no, no GPS, how did we get, we wanted to get away from using GPS, because GPS people feel, oh, you know where I am, okay? So we looked for a new way that we could um, give meaningful information that two people or uh, many people exist in the same location, but without having any physical um, biometric data, GPS being your physical location on the planet. And so what we mean is two objects can exist in the same space, but we don't know where that space is. And to illustrate, I think we should really explain the example with using the locality with the GSM cell okay. and the MAC addresses, because this, because most of the things that we speak about, I know they probably sound like you still don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> but okay. and, and, and it's fine, we are now used to this, which is fine. Um, but <coughs> like trust in any case, so let's go to, uh, to this. Yeah, so it will, it will take some time for you to understand how it's different, but this example mm -hmm. of how the local hash, how we create a hash 
you know how the hashing mechanism, how hashing works in blockchain? I saw some of you are actually developing, but to, to, to explain it, you can hash anything. A hash is just, imagine, it's a way of generating a, a, a fingerprint out of anything. It can be, you can take a single page of a book, or you can take the whole book and generate a hash. The hash will be the same length. But what it, it basically represents is the fingerprint of that page or that book. And if, even if you change one comma or one letter or one word in that page or even in the book, the hash will be different. It's not going to be the same. Because the hash is the collective of the whole represented by this line. And this line becomes a fingerprint. And it's so revolutionary. I know that it took me some time to understand it and to realize what it means to us in, 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 a, in this technological world to be able to verify data of any size, small or big, the same way. So, so this is how we begin to create trust. What we said is that if we want to create a new technology, you have to find a way to allow people to have their own identity without any exceptions to the rules. If you create an exception to the rule, your program is forever going to be updated. You're going to have to write lines of code to fix the bugs as they roll in. Okay? Every time you get an exception, you're going to have to write some more code to deal with that exception. So we were looking at a way how humanity, by your own self, can create your own identity of trust. So what we said is, everybody, in, if you're alive, a living human being, you do things with your everyday life. So why not let's take your everyday life and turn that into your digital self, okay? Nobody else can copy it. It's like your shadow. Nobody in here has a shadow the same. I cannot move behind you all day long, you know? So you have your own patterns, you have your own locations that you're visiting, and the way we're handling it, we don't know where you are, but we know you're there. And we do this because we said, well, look, we've got these mobile devices, fantastic. They've got loads and loads of processing power, but they're useless with batteries, okay? Batteries are terrible. Everybody wants their phone to last at least the whole day, okay? <laughs> so we need to find a way that we don't consume your battery. Your phone, without you knowing, has to do certain things. For you to be able to receive those telephone calls, it has to be able to switch from cell tower to cell tower. It knows the cell towers around it. It knows the cell tower it's currently connected to, okay? Also, for your phone to access Wi-Fi, or to tell you there's a Wi-Fi, it has to scan the, the, the radio waves all the time to see if there's a Wi-Fi. These are actions of the operating system. So you're not actually asking it to do anything else. It's doing this all the time in any case. So we thought, okay, this is great. We can take this data, we can organize it, sort it, so it's always sorted in the same manner, okay? We hash that out so it's a unique fingerprint for that location. Where the location is, we have no clue. And that tells us that you are here, okay? Rather than storing that in a database, which is what people like Google do, and they track your every single movement, we don't care. Because if you're the first person into that space, nothing happens, okay? But now somebody else steps into that same space, that has created an event. Now that we can check from peer to peer, this is all decentralized, none of this is being stored on a separate server, this is all node to node communications, your mobile is only sending information to a node, the node then communicates to all the other nodes and says, I have a unique hash here with an individual who has a tag, uh, Bitcoin, okay? And it says, do you have a tag for Bitcoin? No. Yeah, the, the tag is like an interest. A in tag is just information about you that you want to that match with. You decided you want to share with the world. That's it. That, okay. That's what you decide. But that event is triggered by you, by somebody else entering that same hash, basically. Okay? The minute you step out of that hash, there's no communications. There's no, there's no need for the system to, to notify because now he's the only person in that hash. So we only trigger these events on changes in the environment. So this does away with some other interesting problems, because mobile phones, if you have an application that is continuously saying to a server somewhere, have you got any information for me? Updates, any information? You're burning power, you're draining that battery, okay? If you rely on Google, Google, wonderful Google, aren't they? Um, they 
every time you run your application, you subscribe to their server, so that allows them to push you notifications. Okay? We wanted to make sure that we don't rely on Google service being up so that we can send you notifications. So every time we need to use this data flow um, very efficiently. So that means when you step into that location, you generate a new hash, you send that to the node that you're currently connected to, the node does all its things, but in the OK message that says, OK, I got your, 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 your hash data, it sends back all the information that it needs to tell your application about, do you have new messages, um, you know, if there's uh, an increase, if somebody sent you cryptocurrency, um, all any that event, kind of information. So all those events are um, packaged in there. So we've done a lot of work to make sure the application itself is very <coughs> power friendly. And now how does this connect to trust? Because this is just the technological foundation that drives the application and the platform that we're creating. But the main thing that we built it around was that that was just a means for us to get to the trust factor. And the trust factor, we treat it like, like a cryptocurrency. You can give trust and you can receive trust. We don't say you're losing it, but you're giving it. Um, and the way it works is that the, the main thing is why, why do we need trust? Well, we, we don't really need it, but it will be nice to have it. I mean, I, I think all of you will agree that it will be nice for you to be surrounded by more people that you can trust. And it's, I think it's one of the main human um, aspects, the, the better aspects of life is being surrounded by people you trust. You, you really feel a lot better um, when you're around people that you know. And that's why tri in tribal culture, in tribes, they felt that they developed in a completely different way because you are always surrounded by people you know. Even if you don't trust them, you know you don't trust them. <laughs> and and well, the, way, the way we are living right now, we're, we're completely surrounded all the time by strangers, most of the time. And even if, it, if you don't feel it, your body is in a state of stress all the time because it, it's, it's this constant threat around you. You don't, you don't know what might happen the next moment. Um, and you know, news doesn't happen, doesn't, doesn't help that in too many ways, um, bringing your state of mind this way. But trust, we, we think, is a way to, 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 to um, basically establi establishing the trust is the main thing. Like, how can I trust some of, someone of you? you know, how, how do you get me to trust you? Like we said, it doesn't happen. It's not really an event. It's a series of events that leads to this. And the way we've done this it's is... <laughs> <laughs> um, the way we, we tackle this is this, this unique fingerprint that happens every time you move from location to location. Your phone is talking to all these digital signatures, basically, and creates a new, unique hash for every step along the way. Okay? Now, that hash is not recorded anywhere. It's just used in the moment of time. So how do we generate trust if we're not recording your movements? So what we said, oh, well, blockchain does this every, every time you send a transaction. Yeah? It's verifying that transaction. That transaction is moving coin from one place to another. So if we take trust and we turn it into a token, a coin, a, a digital asset, and we say, OK, I step into this new location. I will send a coin, a bit of a coin, to the node and say, I've got new hash for you, here's my, my, my token for this, this hash. The hash then, the, the node collects that uh, token, and you go on the way your way, on your way. All this time you're actually losing trust. Why yes. is this important? Well, because if somebody picks up your mobile phone, it's not you, you don't want them to be able to spend your money. So, because they don't have your patterns, they will lose trust very quickly. Okay, so it protects your phone. Now, the minute you get home or back to the office, what we call a safe spot, the node... The, the safe spots are the places that you visit the most. You can create a safe spot, and you will have create a safe spot in your house. Basically, there are two locations that you visit all the time, and that's your home and your work. That, that's the most definite, or the place you go to where you work. So safe spots are places you set out from every single day. <coughs> okay? So you leave, you leave home, you go to a friend, have coffee, whatever. You come, when you come back home at the end of the day, what happens is that trust you've been given away all the time. But when you come back home, that trust is returned to you, okay? But you've now had a net gain of zero. You've not gained any trust, you've just got the trust that you've given. So how do we stop hackers uh, from creating a way that they can fake trust? So what we said, well, if two individuals 
two completely unknown individuals walk down the same street, they will create the same set of hashes. Yeah? Do you understand why? Because I'm sure you don't. I mean, I'm sure they're, they're so very the clear, and we know that. They're so in the, the same cell tower. What you can help us with today is just ask questions that will help us in so many ways understand how can we improve explaining this because it's so it's so complicated. To us, it's very simple now, <laughs> but I know it's not easy to it's not easy. Yeah, we will have if you can keep the question. We'll soon okay. finish with this. Okay. Yeah. How do you imagine you will uh, deal with all the different Wi-Fi uh, and, and uh, cell chips in the mobile phone? Yeah, we, we will talk about this. Okay. <laughs> Let me, uh, go, go this. Just, remi so, just remind me about the question, please. <laughs> so, so basically, when two people go down the same street, they generate hopefully the same hash. It doesn't really matter if they do or they don't. But if they happen to generate the same hash, the node creates a multiplier. Okay? So the multiplier is 0 0.001, for example. Okay? So the next time you go down the street, because two people have verified that it exists, you now have multiplied. So when you get back to your safe zone, you get your trust plus now the 0 0.001. If there's 10 people, it goes to 0 0.010. If it goes to 100 people, it's now 0, 1. Okay, so your trust is amplified the more times you go down places where other people have uniquely verified. This way we know that's a real place. Okay. That's, that's the way to protect the network against creating virtual locations that you can not even move around but just simulate it so you can gain trust. And why you need trust? Well, you need trust in order to be able um, to interact in, in, in the, the context of the process of things and the platform and the different applications that will emerge out of it. It will allow you to do things that we know it's you. We don't know. We may not know who you are, but we know it's a real person that wants to either pay or order or <coughs> vote for things or open a door or do things that they are, are allowed to or that um, are important to them or to the context of the the, 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 the organization that they work with, that's so that it can verify <coughs> that it can give you access to something or that, for example, your vote is really you voting for something. Like, like I said, the, the applications, there are multiple applications. Um, and one of the main, the main um, <coughs> ways we, it, we are different than the standard blockchain is that the um, standard blockchain has very, um, very small, li and it, the limitation on the number of transactions, that most of the blockchains have very limited number of transactions they can do per second. And that's uh, <coughs> one of the biggest constraints of the proof of work blockchains. That the, the way they handle transactions is it's, it's working right now, but it's not scalable. So there is no way that it can become the way it is right now. It, it will be very difficult for the standard blockchains right now to become a driver for the future, a, a technology that can change everything we do. Because you know how Internet of Things is growing, machine to machine communication. Now we have AI uh, emerging from the field and of the, that industry is going to demand microtransactions. It's going to demand a lot of transactions and you cannot do this with seven transactions per second or One. 12 transactions per second One. on a global scale. It's not possible. Visa is having 100,000 per second and that's Visa. Okay. So the reason why we have such slow transaction rates is because so much processing power and restrictions on block sizes and all these wonderful things that we have to deal with is because we have a trustless system. We don't trust anybody. My node is my node, and I don't agree. I don't trust any other node, but I will listen to what you've got to say. Okay? So this means we're losing so much processing capabilities because we have trustless blockchains. Okay? Now, the, the reason why they did this is because they want decentralization, okay? And this is fantastic, and we want everybody to be in control of themselves and have their own right to create their identity. So this is what we've done. But how does that help us now get beyond this Transact seven transactions or th 29, which is the highest I've seen it do a blockchain, 29 mm -hmm. transactions per second? Yeah, there are, there are new ones, like EOS, for example, is claiming they're going to have millions of transactions, but that's... EOS and they still run on the Ethereum blockchain, so who knows? Okay, so if we have a layer of trust, the trust is the gatekeeper, okay? If you have trust, then you can interact with everything behind the trust, okay? <coughs> that means 
I have a relationship with him. I don't need to know anything about you guys because <laughs> my friend is this guy here. I already have a relationship with him. So I only need to know that crypto, or what we call transactional currencies, that he invited me to. I don't need to know about the transactional currencies you have, for example. Yeah? Um, I only need to know about the ones that I've already been interacted with. Yeah? So once you've gained that trust, once you have that trust, now you can say, okay, I'm going to invite a friend. You give your trust to that friend. If that friend misbehaves, you lose trust as well. You're taking responsibility for that person. If you take a node and you connect a node to the network, the node doesn't need to know about every single node out there. It needs to know about the nodes that are relationship to you, to the things that you're interested in. So if you're interested in a particular um, coin, a crypto, a transactional currency that you've created, or if you're interested in a particular um, group or organization, um, you only need to have access to those blockchains. You don't need to see any other blockchain other than the ones that you're interested in. And that means that in the future, as quantum computers come online, yeah, quantum computers would basically have the ability to unravel the blockchain because they can do everything so fast. But by having this trust layer, the quantum computer would have to be trusted in Barcelona to be able to see the Barcelona coins. It would or have in this to case, the blockchain, because yeah, it won't blockchain. be able to even know that that blockchain exists if it's not located in Barcelona. The quantum computer in the US wouldn't even have a clue that they even exist, let alone be able to see all the transactions that's going on. So yes, we have decentralization, but that decentralization is localized. Localized to you, because POTS is doing everything between you and the things around you. It doesn't matter about some, what somebody's got in the US unless you travel <coughs> to the US. And then when you get to the US, you're going to be interacting with people in the US. And they will introduce you to the, the local currencies in the US. Yeah? You get my drift? Where are we going with this? Yeah? So that means we can do thousands of transactions per second, not just seven, because we don't need to worry about wasting all that processing power on protecting the network from people we don't know. Because they can't see the network if you don't know them. Yeah? Okay? So, and because of that, that allows us to parallel up these blockchains so that we can not only do a thousand, we can do two thousand or a hundred thousand or a thousand thousand transactions per second. It doesn't matter because we can parallel process these blockchains. So what matters in the, what the, the, the real, what you can take out of this is, uh, it's just, this is just the beginning of something. Like, and we already have applied it into a few industries and they're using it successfully. And the applications are a lot simple than this. This is just the macro, the macro picture of, and it's a different way of handling blockchains. It's a different way of handling transactions. It's a different way of handling technology in general because right now we're used to using centralized technology. But we also give away certain things in the process. Um, we, you know, it's nice to be able to speak to anyone anywhere in the world, and we'll still be doing this 20 years from now. But I believe that we'll also be interacting with the local environment in a completely different way, uh, in a way that we're not losing anything in the process. We're only gaining that, that technology is, is managing our interactions between us and devices and other people in a way that we know we can trust them. Smart contracts did this for the first time to, to the industry by allowing people to execute a contract based on a certain set of parameters. And now they don't need an escrow. Now they don't need a, a middleman for, to have a contract. Now they don't need to go to a notary <coughs> to sign that contract. But the technology is actually doing all this for us. And it will do a lot of other things for us as well. And that's why we, it, we started thinking about, OK, so how how do we manage trust on a personal level? How do we, and you know, how can we attribute trust? And what's, what, 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 is that, what are the things that matter the most in gaining and losing, and how do we measure it? 
And there are still things that we're working with. And if you, any of you are mathematicians and are willing to participate in the process, because attributing value to things seems to be one of the biggest challenges. How do we know how much to give, to give and to move, and to, you know, how, do, how much to spend and to gain in different interactions? Because moving, and you, um, you asked a question about it, and we'll discuss how we uh, deal with the, technologi the technological side of uh, networks and Wi-Fi's and basically the fingerprint that we see around us that gives us the, the hash. But it, it's, it's the user's rating that we, um, we're, we're focused on right now in de developing that, that part and the concept behind it, because it will be in our roadmap, it's one of the things that we'll develop <coughs> over the next year, we'll be focused on improving this, because we see that it's also one of the areas that has biggest potential for, um, for flows, put it this way. And the user rating is, um, like, like Craig said, it's, it's spent by interacting. Because I don't know if you have seen this in your world, but what matters about people is not that much what they're saying, it's what they're doing. I, their actions mean more than their words. And we took the same concept um, and uh, applying it to the process of things. We're saying we don't want to trust someone because just because someone told us we can trust them because this can, be, uh, this can become a problem. So, but how do we trust someone based on their actions then? And that's how the user, rate, the user trust rating came into, into, into play. And it's about measuring and tracking the movements without holding the data. This was the biggest challenge. How do we track things without tracking them? Because a, a pattern, your pattern of movement, now every, each one of your phones, I'm, I'm sure you've seen that, it knows where you have been, uh, it know, and, and it stores all of that data. And most of your applications, when you install an application, you, if you go through the permissions, you will see that you're giving away a lot of access. Um, I have three kids, and my youngest daughter is two years old, and she's playing, she's popping balloons. And I saw that app, and I looked at the permissions. And it, it, want, it wanted to manage my contacts, it wanted access to my camera, it wanted access to, I was like, she's popping balloons. <laughs> and it wanted to be able to control everything on my phone. I was like, and, and the thing is, you have no option. You either agree and install it, or not install it. There is no way you can say, I'm not going to give you all of those things. And, and that's just one simple example, but we all know those things. And so. Uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge, for us it's a challenge to create this, but that's why I believe that it being open source will gather bright minds like yourselves and, and together we can create something really special, something that we already have working. So there, it, this is not a proof, this is not a, a concept. We have it working. We know it can be improved, but it's working. And um, the uses of this are way too many. One of the, one of the things on this subject is the fact that um, Everybody here probably knows that one of the great benefits of, of um, Bitcoin or blockchain is that it's a push technology. You choose to send money to somebody. They can't pull it from you like a Visa card. A Visa card has problems because if they get your details, they can pull your money from you. With all blockchain technology, it's push. I push this money to you, okay? So this has inherent security. So we've done the same thing with your identity. Whenever you see, you go to the coffee shop and you say, oh, okay, they've got a, a pop QR code there, you scan it, it gives you the menu. But at that point in time, what it does, the first time you, you scan something, is it sees, do I have a profile for this organization? Yeah? And if it doesn't, it creates a unique ID for you. It's not your ID. It's not your trusted ID, it's a unique ID. It's like a burner address in Bitcoin. When you get a burner address, you use it, you give it to somebody, they can send money to it, and your, your coin arrives in your wallet. How many of you own Bitcoin? How many of you have Bitcoin? Ah, see, everybody. See, everybody. They all know so, what I'm talking so about. So, so a burner address is this kind of address. That you have a wallet address, for example, but you can see how it changes. Yeah. It's very often, you, know, you go in, it gives you another address. I mean, you can still use your old one. Because the thing is, it will still end up being in the same wallet, but that's what a burner address is. I just, want to, just wanted to explain what the concept is. So we created is. this concept of burner IDs. Basically, when, you're, when you interact with any new organization, you don't use up your ID. So you <coughs> share what information you want to share with them. If you want to give them an email address, you give them an email address. Okay, That's entirely up to you. But you don't need to give them anything. 
Yeah, you have an you have an ID with them. Now they can contribute all that information that your transactions and your history and everything for that ID. Okay, but the minute you want to step away from that, you just delete your profile. You control your profile, not them. Okay, and then when you go back to that organisation. You start again as a fresh new individual. They have no history that you've ever been there before. So this is also part of trust because as we get more and more involved with this type of things, you may get a mortgage. You go to the bank. They say, "Oh, do you have a POC Trust ID?" Yes. Okay. Scan this QR code. It creates a profile, um, but it's a unique profile at that point. You, they give you a mortgage. Okay, we'll give you a mortgage. Um, they don't even need to know your name because they know well, you have ho hopefully ID. you won't need that but yeah, yeah? Um, but now you're 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 inherently saying I don't want to give up my ID because I have this tied to it I, I have this uh, tied to it okay yeah it's like uh, how many have, have had an occasion where you add someone to your friends in Facebook and then you realize well I may I may not want to this person to be able to see everything I do so that, that that's the, that's just uh, an example so, so this means if, if, the, if everything goes wrong, you can say, right, I want to start again. You step out of your physical ID and you create a new one, okay? And so you have complete anonymity. You control what you share with the world. Yeah, and because we, we, yeah, we like talking about this, we can probably go on like this all night. So if any, if, yeah, if, if, any, if any of you have questions, I think we should start with, uh, with talking about it. The, the transactional cryptocurrencies, I'll just try to sum up a few of the next slides shortly. Um, so the main thing is, this is from the technology point, this is built as microservices. It's all API driven and it's going to be open source. So anyone that wants to use this way of validating information, can plug in and build apps built using this technology in, um, in mind. But uh, just uh, quick on the transactional currencies. Transactional currencies, basically, we're saying to people, anybody who has this app can create their own currency, OK? You give it whatever name you like. You put your own, um, you, you put your own uh, ticker. Uh, in the, you basically you define the genesis block for your transactional currency. So you choose how many how many uh, coins are being produced for what purposes. All of this is done in a very user friendly interface. Okay, and what we want to do with this is basically, um, unlike blockchain and unlike Bitcoin and unlike these, we're not saying they are cryptocurrencies. We're saying they're transactional currencies. They're asset based currencies. But you create them yourself. And the coins are generated not through proof of work in a mathematical sense. We tie them to physical processes in the real world. So we might call it a proof of trust. Proof of trust. So that means that that might be as simple as invite a friend, okay? And once you've invited a thousand people, one thousand coins will be distributed evenly to each one of those. So if you invited ten, you get ten coins. If you invited a hundred, you get a hundred coins, okay? Or it could be um, in an office where you have a process, and if you complete that process, you get paid. Yeah. So that's that's where our idea of proof of work comes in. And why is this important? Because this decentralizes exchanges. You don't have to go and try and buy through an exchange from miners coins. By actually doing a process, you get the coin directly into your pocket. Well, we thought about this this way, like. If I have been brought up as a kid in a cave somewhere up in the mountain, I've never seen, and I have one goat that I survive on. The milk from that goat is really important to me. You come up with a hundred dollars or a hundred euro and say, I want to buy that. You know, you know what, you can imagine what I will say to that. You know, you offer me a piece of paper. But the thing is, we trust money. And this is the point that as long as two people trust that this is worth a hundred euro, it's worth a hundred euro. And it's trust that drives it, nothing else. Money has no real backup right now. Apart from government saying, well, we back it up, yeah, okay, but how? I mean, by the GDP, by the housing market, unemployment, and all the macro, yeah, okay, good. But it's the trust that actually, it's the trust that drives it, and trust drives markets. And you can see it reflected every day in movements of, of different cryptocurrencies. Um. And we believe on that, on that basis that, uh, sorry. I think it's time. Okay. Yeah, it's time to wrap it up. Okay.
of your yeah. some uh, right for questions. Yeah, this was this was this is the, this is the last slide. And basically, we're in the process of development. I told you it's driven by uh, microservices. It's built with microservices. It's open source and it's API driven. So if any of you are in the field of development and want to speak to us about it, we are very open to to speak to you.